Todd Bowles may be coaching his last season as the Buccaneers head coach, but can he save his job? That and more on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. Your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs> What's up and welcome into this Tuesday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We want to thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. Don't forget you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can follow along on Twitter. I am James Yarko at JRCO underscore Bucks. He is David Harrison at DHarrison82. We are your hosts of Locked On Bucks, credential members of the media covering your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I am the deputy editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com. David is a staff writer over at BucksGameDay.com, Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation site, covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And we are here with you every Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, we want to share our appreciation for your continued support of the show. And right now, you can become a Locked On Bucks insider, get the latest scoop, the latest news, the latest everything, plus one-on-one -on -one conversations with me via text message. Just head over to jointsubtext.com slash Locked On Bucks to become an insider. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. On today's episode of Locked On Bucks, we are talking about the firing of Frank Wright as head coach of the Carolina Panthers, what it means for this weekend's matchup coming up uh, between the Bucks and the Panthers. Now, we're going to stash and trash a couple things from the loss to the Colts in Week 12. But first, we are going to talk about Todd Bowles, head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And James, we had a question sent in through the Twitter account, I do believe. That is... We did. Uh, ben Rosa, every day or extraordinaire, uh, sent this one in ahead of our live show last night since he wasn't going to be able to tune in at that time. And Ben tweeted over to me, quote, I won't be able to watch your post game reaction live. Can you cover this question? Do you feel Bowles is done as a head coach? No matter what games he wins this season, he won't be able to salvage his job End quote question from Ben Rosa. David, I spoke quite a bit about Bowles on yesterday's live episode, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you the floor right now, and then I can jump in later with any additional thoughts surrounding the Buccaneers fearless leader there. All right. So I know that a lot of people are calling for Todd Bowles' job, and I get it. And every dayers, every yearers, those of you who have been with us through the dirt cutter years, you already know this about me. I am not the call for a person's job kind of guy. And it's not that I don't feel like people should or shouldn't be fired, but in our role, our job is to observe, report, and opinionate, right? I like to provide opinions based on what I know, not what I think. And there's way too much that happens at one buck that deals with the head coach that we don't see and we don't know. And I don't care if you're Peter Report, I don't care if you're Jenna Lane, I don't care if you're Greg Allman. There's too much stuff that goes on at that facility, inside that building, in those meetings, in that organization that involved the head coach that we don't have eyes on or knowledge of for me to sit here and tell you Todd Bowles needs to be fired. That being said, I can tell you if a change needs to be made. And that's where I will make an opinion on is if a change needs to be made. Here's what I'm going to tell you right up front. No, Todd Bowles should not be fired. Now I'm going to tell you why. The Buccaneers defense is the 12th ranked scoring defense in the National Football League. That's dang near, not the other word, dang near the top third of the NFL. And it's very close to being a top third scoring defense in the National Football League. There are only three teams with better ranked scoring defenses that have losing records. The Green Bay Packers, the Tennessee Titans, and the Nolan Saints. All three of those have lower ranked scoring offenses than they do defenses. So let me say that again. Those three teams that have better scoring defenses than the Buccaneers also have worse ranked scoring offenses compared to their scoring defenses leading to their losing records. Tampa Bay Buccaneers have a worse ranked scoring offense than they do a scoring defense. You see where I'm going for this. If the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were scoring 21 points a game in the games that they fail to, 21 points is the middle area. It's not the average, but it's the 16th ranked scoring offense in the NFL. If the Buccaneers were the middle of the pack, 16th ranked scoring offense in the NFL, they would be six and five 
undefeated in the NFC South with a one game lead in the division, holding two tiebreakers right now. That is what this team would be doing if the offense was literally right in the middle, but they're not. They're below the middle of the eight offenses scoring fewer points per game than the Buccaneers are this season. Only two of them don't have a first year play caller for their team. Because as you know, Dave Canales is a first year play caller for this team. Not just ever, but for this team specifically. Eight offenses in the NFL are scoring more points per game than the Buccaneers with a first year offensive play caller. So maybe that's not an excuse for Dave Canales. Okay, pers personally or potentially that could be fair. Only two of those eight offenses are being run by first year play callers who are also in their organization for the first year. So if you do the math on this, Dave Canales is the highest scoring first year play caller with in his first year with the current franchise. Those other two coordinators that are with or for other two play callers, I should say, because one of them is Sean Payton, not a coordinator, but a head coach. He's in his first year with his team, but the dude ain't in his first year running an NFL offense. Dave Canales, first year running an offense, first year with the franchise he's in, is the highest scoring coordinator in that situation in the NFL. Nobody in that same situation, in the same context, is doing it better. The defense is nearly a top third scoring defense in the NFL. So no, Todd Bull should not be fired. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Has it been perfect? No. More often than not, it's been extremely flawed. And Todd Bowles is acknowledging that as well. But this is not all on the defense. This is not all on the defensive coordinator. And I'm not even putting it all on Todd Bowles because let's not forget that this dude got his head coaching job post scouting combine. All right. 90% of NFL draft prep is done by the time you leave Indianapolis. Todd Bowles literally got this job with someone else's crew someone else's playbooks, except for the defense playbook, and someone else's draft prep. I don't honestly even think it's necessarily 100% fair to put last year's draft class on Todd Bowles. But even if you do, the only draft pick that you can look at from Todd Bowles' tenure as head coach, and we all know Jason Light has plenty to say, that has not worked out the way you want it to, is Logan Hall. But all the other picks, I mean, some of them, fifth, sixth round draft picks, no, they're not stars, but I'm not going to hold that against them. But you look at some of the picks that he has made in his first year completely at the helm, Kalijah Kansi, Yaya Diaby, Servasier Dennis, you certainly see the, the, the potential in that dude. These are guys that Todd Bowles is bringing in with a full time period that every NFL head coach asks for. There are a reason that coordinators are getting interviewed for these jobs during the playoffs because you need that time. Not only did Todd Bowles not get that time, he didn't even get time to get his staff. This is the first year he's looking at getting his staff. And so to me, Last year is a dead year. I don't hold that against Todd Bowles. I just can't. I just can't. It is so contextually impossible to expect a head coach to have full control of his operations in that situation. He's literally driving Bruce Arians' car, but he's not Bruce Arians. This year, he is building his car. And oh, by the way, handed one of the worst salary cap situations in the NFL in the process. So all of that stuff stacked up. This, to me, is Todd Bowles' first year as the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in this conversation. And if that's the case, with the 12th ranked scoring defense in the NFL and the best first-year play caller, first year in his franchise, offensive coordinator in the NFL, no, I don't fire him. I keep this rolling. I spend another offseason trying to balance my books because they're not out of salary cap heck yet. And I give Todd Bowles a fair shake, which is not 12 games, 11 games before I fire him because that is nowhere near a fair shake. That is not at all what I expected to hear. Now I, I know it's not. I, and that's why it's beautiful. I, I'm not saying that I expected you to pull out a, a James Yarko soapbox on why he should be fired. But that is that is an interesting take, and I will have more of a response uh, to it here coming up next, as well as us stashing and trashing, as we always do every week on this show. That is coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Box, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 
You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. You guys know I've talked on this show numerous times about keeping an eye on game time to get those Foo Fighters tickets that I so desperately want. But it doesn't have to be a concert. It can be a Bucks game. It can be a Lightning game. Heck, if you want to fly up to D.C. and check out the Commanders getting probably boat raced by the Miami Dolphins, you can do that too. But Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All-in prices show your total up front, so you know you're getting a great deal without any hidden fees. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of an event and even an hour after it starts. It is the place to find last minute seats. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N F L for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks again, everybody, for making a Locked On Bucks first listen or your first view today and every day. Every day, as always, greatly appreciate you coming through on a regular basis like you do. Football season is entering the December home stretch. Critical football is coming up, and our kick it, our coverage is kicking up on Locked On NFL Kickoff Live. Also, check out the Locked On Sports Today stream, the first ever 24-7 national sports stream on YouTube. Tons of great stuff going on on the network. James. Uh, other great stuff going on in the network is everything that I just said about Todd Bowles because every Bucks fan is going to hear me. They're going to be logical and they're going to realize that everything I said is true. But what do you have to say? Well, I mean, again, I'm I'm shocked because as everyone knows, you're you're a like card carrying Todd Bowles hater. Like we know that 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 was that was a big thing there for a while. Yeah, uh, to some. but. No, like everything that you said makes a lot of sense. And and I've said my piece. And and my big my big thing is I don't think that Todd Bowles survives this season unless they do put together a run and and end up making the playoffs. They go 4-0 in their remaining division games and uh and they have a shot at the division. Outside of that, I don't think that that he survives, but I've also talked about the ramifications of that and the domino effect of if Bowles goes, you have an entirely new staff. That means you're probably going to be bringing in a different quarterback to fit the offensive philosophy of whoever that the new offensive coordinator is, which means you're probably going to lose Mike Evans and Levante David because they're up there in age and they're not going to want to go through another rebuild. You have all of those things to take into consideration. And oh, by the way, you still have other positions that desperately do need to be filled far sooner than the quarterback position. So oh. I I can 100% see it going either way. And while I agree by and large with your assessment of the situation, I don't think that's what we're going to see play out over the over the long term. But I am going to talk I, a little bit. Oh, go I, ahead. I agree with you. I agree with you. That I don't think it's going to happen. I just think it should happen. There are two people I blame for this. Bill Belichick and John Gruden, because in a football sense, they have helped feed into the Big Mac generation of sports fans and media that we have today. And I say media because I count us in this picture where we don't have time to wait for the medium well ribeye to get cooked. We want the Big Mac and we want it now because Bill Belichick signed on with the Patriots in 2000 and then they did nothing but win Super Bowls for the next 20 years. So that's what every NFL head coach should be able to do. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers traded for John Gruden and nothing else happened. Nothing else happened, except if you're a listener of the show, you know, a lot happened, but nothing else happened. They just traded for a coach and poof, a Lombardi showed up out of nowhere. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that Bill Belichick also had 20 years to shape the New England Patriots to be a good competitive, competitive, competitive team after Tom Brady. And they are a dumpster fire. Nobody wants to talk about John Gruden won a Super Bowl and then they did hardly nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Not uh, for the next however long he lasted until he got fired. Like this obsession with, with, with you should be able to turn my franchise around in the snap of a finger 
not just from ownership, but from media. And because owners expect it, media expect it, fans expect it. I don't even blame fans because if the media wasn't telling you this was possible or this should happen, and if owners weren't trying to hold head coaches to this standard, the fans wouldn't expect it. So fans are just feeding off of what we're giving them and the owners are giving them. It's crap. It's BS. There's no coach. I don't care who you are. There is no coach in the history of this game that could inherit a team and a coaching staff right before the NFL draft, take them in that cap situation and make a with okay with that offensive coordinator and, and have a successful team it just not is not going to happen i don't care who you are it's not going to happen you look at the denver broncos roster and you look at sean payton and what sean payton and how long it has taken for sean payton to get this team to where they are right now where they're now just now competing to win games that let's be quite honestly like the kansas city chiefs are down and some of these other teams are having down seasons compared to who they usually are. And the Denver Broncos are just now getting to the point where they're able to compete and win some of those games. Sean Payton, who I know we all hate, but that dude's a Hall of Fame coach. That's how long it's taken him. And he had the entire offseason. He had the draft. He had free agency. He brought in a bunch of old saints who know his system. And he had the entire NFL draft for himself. That dude took almost a full NFL season to just win some games. Like we're not even talking about hoisting trophies, win some games, but we expect Todd Bowles to do it in a much worse situation with no money in less time. It doesn't make any sense to me, but it's not fans' fault. It's our fault and it's owners' fault. It's billionaires and media people. We suck. <laughs> it's the instant gratification society. And not to mention last year, and, and I don't want to keep harping on this, but he didn't have the Tom Brady that we saw in 2020 and 2021. We He had the Tom Brady that said, and I quote, there's a lot of expletive going on. It, when talking about his personal life, he was going through a divorce. He was you know, dealing with, with off-field stuff. Dude disappeared for like 10 days during training camp. We were there when he disappeared. So yeah, there, there's a lot more to it than just wins and losses but david let's go ahead and talk some stashing and some trashing let's start with the with the stash then we're going to flip over to the uh the trashing segment uh after the next break but what is your stash from week 12 against the indianapolis colts uh explosive running look rashad white had 15 carries for 100 yards he had three explosive runs totaling 62 yards total 40 percent of the tampa bay buccaneers drives rashad white got the ball one time or less when you have a running back running at that clip he needs to get the ball a lot more than that that's only acceptable if you're scoring in three plays or less which one of those drives they did but the other drives they did not rashad white should have got the ball more yesterday and they need to find a way to harness this rushing performance and translate it down the road Yep, uh, I, I agree completely. Rashad White looked good. He looked good in yesterday's game. I said on, on the live episode that I would have liked to have seen him be involved a little bit more in the passing game the way we had seen over the course of the last month, but still incredibly productive uh, and, and really uh, did some good things for the Buccaneers. My stash is a simple one. Uh, let Mike Evans continue to be Mike Evans. Just always give him the ball. Like, I'm I'm done pounding the table and getting out my soapbox and grinding my gears uh, for more Godwin targets because they're just not there. And instead, just feed Mike all the time. In his career, this this is a fun little nugget. In his career, when the Bucks are inside the 10-yard line, he has 43 receptions. 42 of those have been touchdowns. That is a 97% scoring rate. Uh, he is now 150 yards away from his 10th consecutive 1,000-yard season, extending his own NFL record, and now closing in on another 1,000-yard streak record held by some dude named Jerry Rice. Like, I'd never really heard of him until I was looking at the at the records. Uh, kind of an obscure guy, honestly, to have a record like that. But, yeah, just always give Mike Evans the ball all the time for the rest of history. But David, we are going to be trashing a couple of things, uh, both from the game and regarding another franchise within the division. That is coming up next here on Locked on Bucks. Score this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get 
$150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks if your team wins. The Buccaneers are currently five and a half point favorites to beat the coachless Carolina Panthers this weekend. The over under on total points is 37 and a half. That's not a great number for your fantasy outlook. And the Bucs are minus 220 favorites on the money line. And if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in the action than right now. I actually told my dad today, hey, you should probably go ahead and join FanDuel and throw down a $5 money line bet on the Carolina Panthers because this could be interesting. But the app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and score this NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Wrapping things up here on a Tuesday episode of Locked on Bucks podcast, James Yarko, David Harrison, and it's time to trash some things. And mine isn't, it's not exactly uh, week 12, but it is because now I'm starting to see the social media outrage ramp up. You know, we've talked about people on social media. They want to, they want Todd Bowles fired. They want Baker Mayfield benched or cut or move on from him, all that stuff. But now, now we're starting to see the people look for a change in the guy that has been running the team since 2014. And that, of course, is Jason Light. And this line of thinking is dumb. Uh, like it or not, Jason has actually been really, really good as the GM. And he has his misses in the draft. But as I've said before, show me a GM that hasn't had any misses in the draft. And I'll show you one that has never made a pick. And Jason Light only has one true coaching hire in his tenure and it led to the head coach that led the Buccaneers to a Lombardi trophy. So he was hired after Lovey Smith. The switch to Dirk Cutter was an organizational decision because they didn't want to lose Dirk Cutter. Then Jason actually gets to hire Bruce Arians. Then Bruce bounces and it's an organizational decision to promote Todd Bowles. So again, one actual coaching hire. He is the one that constructed the roster that made Tom Brady want to join and bring along his buddies Gronk and Lenny and Antonio Brown, which was cool for like that half season. Uh, you know, Jason Light found the gems like Antoine Winfield Jr., Ali Marpet, Shaq Barrett, Levante David, Christian Isian, Kate Otten, Scotty Miller, Mike Edwards, Jordan Whitehead. These are all guys who are or were big contributors to the Bucs, some of which in the Super Bowl run, and then they cashed in and got big money elsewhere. Uh, Jordan Whitehead's been crushing it for the Jets. Uh, Mike Edwards, he's yeah, you know, he's been all right for the Chiefs. But if you're gonna bash Light's draft misses as an excuse to oust him, you also have to credit him on his hits, and there's a lot of them. And trusting him to do his job and find the right pieces for the team, both players and coaches, will work out. Firing him along with Bowles is an absolutely idiotic idea. If you just let him do his job and build a roster like we know he can and we've seen him do, you're you're going to be fine. He's the second longest tenured GM in team history behind Phil Kruger, who was the GM and assistant to the president from 78 to 91. But you fire light, you fire the coaches. Now you're drafting a rookie quarterback. These are not quick fixes that immediately turn your team into a contender. Light has navigated through a horrendous cap situation that he is partially responsible for. but. He did it to get a Lombardi trophy and, and contend for a second one. And no one was complaining about the job that Jason Light was doing during that run. So stop making things even worse and making the mountain even steeper to climb by trying to oust yet another person. It's dumb. Yeah, so I bulls that I deal with all that too. I'm trashing Baker Mayfield's turnovers. Um, look, if you came through for the live, you already know that I don't like the string of, of turnovers Baker Mayfield has had. But every day is don't worry. This is not a repeat. I'm going to go deeper on this. Um, three interceptions, specifically the Baker Mayfield has had in recent games. His interception against the Tennessee Titans. I'll be a little bit quicker on because they won that game. But it's covered two, and he's targeting five foot nothing Devin Tompkins on a seam route with no right quarter deep route to stress the cover two safety help uh, over the top. At the same time, while he's tracking Tompkins on a third and fifteen from the Titans Titans forty two, the middle zone linebacker who usually stops shallow is literally back to Baker Mayfield full sprint running with Devin Tompkins. So you've got a middle linebacker 
running behind Devin Tompkins, a cover two safety over top of Devin Tompkins, and nobody to stress that zone. And oh, by the way, Devin Tompkins, really short. He ain't mossing nobody, including my 16-year-old son. No reason to throw that ball there. Oh, by the way, K. Dotton and Rashad White, both wide open for field goal range plays that would not have got a first down, but they would have put you in field goal range. Again, the Titans won the or the Bucks won the game over the Titans, so we forgive, we forget. Interception against the 49ers. The Niners are basically in umbrella coverage on third and six at their own nine-yard line. There's not really a scheme call for it's not cover two, cover four. I don't know. It's cover eleven. The Bucks run three rounds, three routes into the end zone and an out and in by Chris Godwin underneath at the six yard line of the San Francisco 49ers. Baser, Bas- Baker Mayfield has three over routes going from right to left, two lined up on the right side, one lined up on the left side. So that's a corner route right to left. Right. Uh, and the underneath route by Godwin on the left hand side. So if you start a progression on the left against that defense, you know, you have two reads deep corner routes, K. Dotton or the underneath to Chris Godwin, the Niners defense on that side drops deep, so he wisely goes to Chris Godwin. Problem is, the ball isn't out when Godwin makes his break. Instead, Mayfield holds the ball, and while Godwin is wide open at the San Francisco 6 with the possibility of getting to the 5 or the 4, not a first down, but it's fourth and short, fourth and uh, fourth and short going for a first and goal. Every defender near him is breaking backwards. Mayfield takes a hit. The ball is too far out in front of Godwin. It gets deflected. It's intercepted. The Bucks turn the ball over. Now, it's late in the game. You're down two scores. If he makes the right throw, do the Buccaneers win the game? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you they have a much better chance if the quarterback gives it to them, and it was there for the taking. Interception against the Colts. The Colts are in cover three. The Bucs run a deep comeback on the left side with Mike Evans, a deep over from right to left with Chris Godwin. Chase Edmonds is coming out of the flat, out of the backfield. Play actions, first and 10. It's a 3-3 game on your own, 36. Evans is wide open at his break. Mayfield is at the top of his drop at his break. It's set up perfectly. It's set up beautifully. Baker Mayfield takes another hitch and a half before he throws the ball. In that time, the linebacker that is on the far left hash when he hits the top of his drop is now in the passing lane. It's an easy interception. The Colts get the ball in Buccaneers territory. It's opportunities wasted. They're not scheme issues. They're not play call issues. They're execution issues. It's a consistently late passer on these plays, which is a telltale sign of a quarterback that is not playing with confidence, and he's too much of a veteran to make those kinds of throws. you got to trash those interceptions. Yeah, it hasn't been great. And as much as as Baker has kept uh, the Bucs in some games, he's also made some, you know, made some mistakes that we talked about. We said that he was going to make some stupid decisions and, and some stupid mistakes, not to the same level of um, of Winston, you know, in the past, but definitely some that just leave you uh, shaking your head. But David, real quick on Frank Reich before we get out of here, the Carolina Panthers half fired head coach Frank Reich following a one and ten start because is it is it David Tepper is the owner? Uh, yep. He's he is the new worst owner in the NFL since Snyder is gone, and he apparently also believes that there are immediate and quick turnarounds in the NFL. So that means that Tepper has fired his third coach in five years and is shelling out $70 million, 40 for Matt Rule, 30 for Frank Reich, for coaches no longer employed by the team. So we were just talking about Reich maybe being a one and done. Turns out we were a little more right than we thought on our live Sunday episode. Your thoughts on the move by Carolina, who, oh, by the way, play the Bucks this weekend. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. The the idea of trading the best running back in the NFL last season, trading your only legitimate wide receiver before the NFL draft to go get a rookie quarterback and then hand them to your new head coach with a barely anything of a defense outside of uh, Brian Burns and saying, go win me football games is ridiculous. And the fact that David Tepper, who grew up in the NFL with the Pittsburgh Steelers organization, thinks that that's how you do business shows you that this is not a man who learned anything while he was with one of the greatest franchises in NFL history, one of the most consistently successful franchises in NFL history. The entire time he was sitting there with the Steelers, he said, I can do that better. Well, guess what, Dave? No, you can't. You're not. You're destroying that franchise. And I don't really care because I don't cover them, but I feel bad for Julian Council, who has to cover them and talk about this team because it's a nightmare. He's not doing anything illegal. Fantastic. Congratulations. But he is easily the worst owner in the National Football League. I don't know. After all the Congratulations, shade- Frank. For uh, the the forty million dollar vacation you just got sent on, buddy, have a good yeah. time in Hawaii. Uh, I I don't I don't think a lot of our listeners are going to feel bad for Julian after the way he just absolutely tried to bury the box on the divisional crossover. Preview. That's fair. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, that's which fair. I I will remind him about on crossover Thursday, even though uh, the Bucks aren't quite in a great position. But I will remind him 
uh, about his comment about the Bucks going back to where they belong in obscurity. So, uh, yeah, my thoughts are this just has all the makings now of the Carolina Panthers getting a win on Sunday. They're going to have that emotional rah rah victory for their interim head coach, and the Bucks are going to do the same thing that they always do and make stupid mistakes that cost them uh, in a pivotal must win game. So we have that to look forward to. You know what our everydayers have to look forward to? That is Evan Klosky coming up on tomorrow's WTSP Wednesday episode. But we are out of here. Please check out everything that David is doing over at BucksGameDay.com. Check out my work over at BucksNation.com. Follow everything on Twitter at LockedOnBucks, at JRCO underscore Bucks, and at DHarrison82. Join the Locked On Bucks insiders at JointSubtext.com slash LockedOnBucks. We have a blast over there. I highly, highly recommend it. Hope you all have an absolutely outstanding day. Stay safe, stay healthy, fire the cannons. Thank you so much for joining us right here on Locked on Bucks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. 